We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, he makes us so glad. Let's just go before the Lord before we sing to our great God. Lord, we come humbling ourselves before you. You are King of kings and Lord of lords. Amazing love, how can it be, the song says, that you, my king, would die for me. <laughs> Lord, when we look upon ourselves and we see how lost we were in sin. But Jesus, you came and you died and your sacrifice redeemed us from sin, made us your sons and your daughters. And we're so grateful, Lord. We come to praise you, Lord, and thank you for your great sacrifice and to worship you because you are above all. We worship and praise your holy name. And we pray now that you would fill this place with an outpouring of your Holy Spirit. Lord, that you would anoint Pastor Tim as he brings forth the word and anoint our ears to hear and our hearts to receive and obey. Our minds and our wills, Lord, transform us that we would be your people, obedient to your will and your way. And we ask, God, that there is anyone that does not know you, may this be their day of salvation. May yes. this be their day, yes. Lord, that you would be glorified. Amen. We ask all this. Receive this offering of praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Why don't you stand with us? Sins of the world. 
lamb, the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him. I am set free. Sing that. I am set free. Oh, 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 oh. I am set free. Oh, 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 oh. It is for freedom that I am set free. Sing that again. I am set free.
Heavenly Father, Lord, you gave us all. Lord, you created us. You said it is very good. And Lord, here we are, by your grace, by your mercy. Lord, because you paid a price that was beyond our ability. We are so undeserving, but Lord, we are so grateful that you pay the ultimate price for our sin, for our salvation. And Lord, we have the hope of a future of eternity with you in heaven. Lord, thank you for allowing us to sing your praise here this morning. We love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. Good morning. Calvary Chapel. What a wonderful day to worship the Lord. Take two seconds to say hi to one another. Good morning again. Good seeing all of you and those of you online or if you're out in the courtyard, good to see you with us this morning. We had a great first service. We're looking forward to what God will do here in this second service. So, uh, just, uh, man, you guys came to worship today, too, by the way. Uh, yeah, that was some good stuff. Uh, yeah, it's good. Yeah, give your hand. I love to see people worship God. When you get to heaven, you ain't seen nothing yet, right? We are going to worship. Uh, so this is all, I, I always look at our time here on earth as practicing uh, everything we do. Uh, you won't have to practice Prayer in heaven, because you know it, it, it's just you'll be Jesus is right there. But singing will continue to do. So you practice here for what you'll be doing there. So uh, great to worship. Thank you to the team and thank uh, Phil on drums now. Thank you for jumping in there. Yeah, it's been a long time since we had drums. I didn't even know they made this little small little profile set. So because uh, I didn't think any drums could fit on our stage, but. Uh, uh, made it work, so that, that's good stuff. A couple of quick things uh, in addition to what Pastor Trevor. I, the first thing, I want to appeal to if you have even the slightest notion of serving in VBS, say yes to the Spirit and do it. So uh, we, need, we need to up the volunteers considerably. Uh, There's a great opportunity to meet the community. We have a lot of parents around here that will bring their kids. So if you have even a notion of serving. We don't care what age you are, we will find a place for you. Uh, we don't discriminate on age. You can be young, middle, older, in between, all that stuff. We'll, we'll find a place for you. So uh, the bake sale, very important, you know, kind of uh, raising some of the funds for it so it doesn't touch funds that we need for the mission trip to Guatemala and uh, other things that we're doing. But at the same time, we need uh, people to serve. So Thank you in advance uh, for signing up, and we have the online sign up as well as uh, over the information booth. And uh, a couple other quick things. Um, the graduates, I know that more than half of our seniors may not even be in here uh, because summer's a weird thing. You can never get ahead of summer. There, like every week, there's people out of town for a different thing. But I know that we've got a few seniors that aren't even here this morning. I don't see their families, but I don't. But I said we've got some that are. But we have a few. Raise your hand if you're one of the seniors that graduated. I see one hand, two hands, three hands. Yep. How about college graduates? How about any college graduates? Uh, so we've got three seniors. I know we've got three or, uh, two or three more seniors that aren't here. Um, they love your prayers. They also love cash. So, um, <laughs> so if you see them, they love your prayers. But if you decide that you want to give them a card with cash, they love that too. I, I found that. And I, when I was a senior, that was my favorite thing too. So, you know, but uh, we want to just uh, be praying for them and these new steps in their life. And uh, I'll pray for them when we pray for revival as well. And then, uh, so a couple weeks ago, we had the Barrick family here. And Andy texted me on Friday. I said, hey, how did things go? And he sent me these pictures from Bolivia. Uh, and look at Jen surrounded by all those kids. Yeah, they loved... Uh, they got to speak to a military base. And uh, I haven't got all the details, but I got to speak to a group, uh, the Bolivian military, in the schools. I mean, they let them all... The government just opened up the doors and let them come in. And he said that they had not hundreds saved, thousands saved. 
Isn't that great? Yeah. So they, they passed out a lot of Bibles in Spanish, and then, and then Jen's little book with her testimony and scriptures and prayers for different seasons of your life um, really ministered to a lot of the, the young ladies that were there. And so I'm looking forward to hearing all the details, but um, that's what he sent me, and just wanted to thank you guys for your prayers. And wasn't Sam a blessing last week, too, by the way? Um, yeah, he really was, too. And God... He was in Lynchburg yesterday for this church plant, and they, they just had their anniversary officially yesterday. They celebrated with us, too, but, uh, but it's been blessed, a blessed time to have some of these groups come in, or these brothers and sisters in Christ that are friends of ours and family and the Lord. So be praying for Sam and Miriam, as well as the barracks. And then, uh, so this coming Wednesday and the following Wednesday, I'll be back in the Psalms. I'll be teaching Psalm 118 this Wednesday, and then the following Wednesday, Psalm 119, which is the longest book of the Bible. So we'll be here till Thursday. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Um, it's the longest book of the Bible, but I will not be covering every verse, nor will I read every verse. I'll probably read 25 different verses or so in uh, uh, kind of a hopscotch through Psalm 119. It's been one of the most instrumental books of the Bible in my life and probably... Many, many other people would say that too. It's the law of the Lord, his word. And we'll look at his mercy in, in um, uh, Psalm 118. So that's the next two Wednesdays. And probably we'll just have a few more psalms this summer, and then we'll uh, turn the page and look at some different parts of this, uh, the Old Testament in the fall. But it's not going to happen until the fall. Just with I, I looked at the calendar with VBS and our Guatemala trip and different things. It's not going to be till the fall. So we'll stay in the psalms through August, and then uh, we'll... I uh, have some other things. And I might do a little mini prophecy Wednesday night thing in the fall too, but I, I just kind of want to put that out there in advance. So that's kind of how things are looking for the next couple of Wednesdays throughout the summer. And as we pray for revival, we pray for a lot of countries, uh, quite a few. I'm going to say we started, I don't know, uh, a third of the way in last year. So we've probably prayed for 40 to 50 countries by name, in addition to praying for revival for our country every single week. But Believe it or not, we haven't prayed specifically for Mexico, which is the closest country other than Canada uh, to us. Uh, and so we'll be praying for our neighbors just to the south of us. Uh, I'm thankful for what God is doing in Mexico. I'm thankful for Mexican food. I love it, but uh, that's not what we're praying about. Uh, but I am thankful that uh, we have a lot of Calvary chapels planted in the, the country of Mexico, quite a few. Jeff and Nicole came from a ministry in Mexico before they planted their in Case um, uh Guatemala, but uh, there's there's some great works taking place and some uh, amazing things happening. I have a niece that's headed to Baja, Mexico, for the whole summer on a mission trip, and actually flew out what, Saturday morning. Yeah, flew out Saturday morning. So uh, we'll be praying for Mexico this morning, as well as our own nation. And our nation needs a lot of prayer, a lot of prayer. We are rebel. I, I love our country, but we're a rebellious country. We're in a moral country, we're in an arrogant country, we're an idolatrous country, and yet God's given us a lot. Of, when people say, you know that song, God shed his grace on thee? He has. He's given us a lot. I, he's a lot of, he's very patient with me, and I believe he's incredibly patient with our country. I wouldn't have the patience with our country that God does. How about you? But I wouldn't have the patience. With, I would have already blown up the whole world if I was God. So uh, thankfully, he is long-suffering uh, I would be the wrong person, because I, but then I would have to blow myself up because I have messed up so many times, so, so none of it works. It has to be God. But if you're able to get on your knees and pray with us, do so. If you can't, if you have any reason you need to stay seated, that's totally fine. Let's pray for revival. About 45 seconds of silence, and then I'll pray also for our graduates and for the nation of Mexico as well. We are so grateful 
That you so love the world that you sent your only begotten Son. That you're not willing that any should perish, no matter how rebellious, no matter how resistant, no matter how immoral, no matter how evil people or this world can be. Lord, you died for all sinners. And even your servant, the Apostle Paul, long after being saved, said that he was the chief of sinners. So Lord, we, even in this room, if we've been saved by your grace, we're not looking down at a lost and dying world. We're pleading with them, as, and we're pleading with them by the Holy Spirit within us. And Lord, we pray that um, the grace and the mercy that you've extended would be received very soon with repentance. We pray for a work of revival in this church, Lord. We still have a lot of lukewarmness in us, in this room. Lord, we still have a lot of going through the motions. Lord, we don't want to go through the motions. We want to be filled with the Spirit. We ask that you'd wash and cleanse us of our own sins. Maybe we walked in this room with attitudes or baggage that needs to be left at the cross. And we pray even as we go through this message and we take the Lord's Supper, Lord, you just purify your church. You started it with worship, Lord, now with prayer and then with the word, we pray that you'd wash us this morning with the watering of your word, but also, Lord, just your precious blood. Lord, we pray that you'd bring an awakening to the body of Christ. Lord, there's a sleeping church in this country. Evil is taking and shouting from the rooftops. Lord, let us be those that would counter with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that you would break chains and darkness and people that are in darkness and people that are in addictions. And, and Lord, we see the evil things that are being celebrated even in this month. And Lord, we pray that you would bring repentance to our country in every way, in every shape, in every form. And Lord, we just ask, Lord, not only in this nation, but we pray uh, in the nation to the south of us, uh, Mexico. Lord, you love the people of Mexico. We're, we're thankful for what you're doing there, the many Calvary chapels that have been planted all over that country, Lord. And we pray uh, in other ministries too. Uh, Lord, we thank you for what you're doing and the souls you're saving in Mexico. Lord, I pray for a revival there. They have a lot of bloodshed just like we do. And uh, Lord, there's so many things that need to be, uh, Lord, just forgiven and cleansed in that nation, just like our own. So we pray that you bring revival to that country as well as around the world. And we pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters. We remember them this morning, that Lord, you'd rescue them, deliver them, heal them. Lord, just be mighty among them. And Lord, I pray for our graduates. Lord, I pray that they would follow you all the days of their lives, Lord, that they would seek you first in your righteousness, and Lord, that you would have plans that would prosper them uh, in the work of Jesus and the vocations that you give them. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for praying with us. Uh, if you would turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2, we pick it up with where we left off two weeks ago. If you were Call. We had uh, read the first portion here in uh, the Spirit falling and coming upon the church, and then Peter standing to preach, and with Sam, uh, Dr. Sam here last week, we took a break. So we'll pick it up with where we left off. I'm not going to read the entire section of what we're going to read just for the sake of time. I want to read the first portion, then I'm going to drop to the last verse, and then we'll fill in the gap of Peter's message as I go through this message. Uh, but I do want to pick up with the verses that we had read at the end because uh, it kind of bridges the gap of uh, where we're going to be at today. So pick it up with me, even though we're covering verses 25 through 41, uh, I'm going to pick it up with 22 to kind of take us back two weeks and Peter stands up. So pick it up with me in verse 22. We'll read verses 22 through 28 and then verse 41 and then we'll fill in the gaps uh, as we go through. So verse 22, starting there, men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined uh, purpose and foreknowledge of God. You have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand. I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced, 
and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Stop there and go all the way to verse 41. We'll fill in the gaps as we read through this text. Verse 41, at the end of Peter's message, this is what we see. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Let's pray. Father, we come before you 2,000 years or so after Pentecost, but we are grateful, Jesus, that the same Holy Spirit that you poured out has been in our presence and is in this room and lives within every one of us that's been born again by the grace and mercy of God. And we're thankful that the same Spirit that breathed these scriptures is, Lord, speaking to us right now by your word, is opening our ears, softening our hearts. Lord, we pray that we would not just be hearers, but we'd be doers and appliers of what it is you are speaking by the Spirit to us, your children. And if anyone here does not yet know you as Lord and Savior, even today would be the day of salvation for them. I ask for your wisdom, your help, your strength, your anointing, for I could never do this without your help. In Jesus' name, amen. A little bit of review going back two weeks. The approximate 120 disciples had waited in prayer. They had waited in supplication. And in unity, they were believing by faith that the Holy Spirit would be poured out. Before he had been poured out, they, they knew that Jesus had promised it. And then on the 50th day from the Feast of First Fruits, remember Jesus rose from the dead on the, day of, or the, on the Feast of First Fruits. Count 50 days or 49 days, and then the 50th day, one day after the 49 days, you had the day of first fruits. The Feast of First Fruits, Jesus rises. Pentecost is on the day of first fruits, not to be confused with the Feast of First Fruits, which is also called, Pentecost is called the Feast of Weeks or Shavuot. So you have all of this taking place on this 50th day. They're waiting, and it happens to be. In the providence of God, he's going to send his spirit there on Pentecost. And the spirit comes, and suddenly, like a mighty rushing wind out of heaven, and the entire city heard it. The spirit comes out of heaven and moves in this wind right into the upper room, filling that room with power and the presence of the spirit, filling the 120 that were in that room, or approximately 120, with the power of the Holy Spirit. And as John the Baptist, who was the cousin of Jesus and the forerunner to the Messiah, had proclaimed and foretold, all the believers that were gathered there, the church collectively and each individual that was in that room, as John had said would take place, they were all baptized by the Holy Spirit and with fire. But not a fire that hurt them, not the fires of hell, the fire of the holiness of God. And the power and the purifying work of the Spirit immersing their souls. And then there was a visual representation of the Spirit because above their heads, they all had flames of fire. That'd be pretty cool. That would really let people know the rest of your life you're a Christian if we all walked around with a flame. But notice that it didn't seem to be there when they spilled out of the building. But it was that sign. They had all been sealed. They'd all been baptized by the Spirit. Now, immediately, when the Spirit came upon them, they were all filled and baptized with the Spirit. Their mouths began to speak as the Spirit prompted them. And their words were glorifying and proclaiming the wonderful works of God, which no doubt included the central work of God sending His Son. And as soon as they spilled out of the upper room into the crowds, the crowds that had already heard the mighty rushing winds, these 120 or so had no idea that their singular spoken language was being heard by languages from all over the world. 
this would really make obsolete all these apps on our phone to translate everything. I'm just going to speak in English, and you're going to hear whether you speak Hindi, whether you speak Swahili, whether you speak Spanish. But all of this was to infuse the church, this work of the Spirit, was to infuse the church and the disciples with the power to be witnesses. We need the Holy Spirit's power to be witnesses. We're, we're too weak. We're too fearful. We're too whatever. And as Peter rises to speak, being supernaturally understood, he's speaking one language, but it was un he was understood by all the nationalities, all the ethnicities that were there, and he's filled with the Holy Spirit, yet another unmistakable, powerful work was about to commence. We read it in the last verse, if you're taking notes. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit and souls saved. It takes a miracle to convince an unbelieving person to come to saving faith. Amen? That's how stubborn we all are. That's how hard-hearted we are. That's how sinful we are. It is hard to get people saved, but it's not hard for God. Amen? You can imagine the scene, the multitudes that are gathered, thousands from all over the world gathered there for Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks. The entire morning, when it started at 9 a.m., has been one of astonishment and amazement. What they heard coming down from heaven and how they could hear the disciples in their own language and what could they make of all the joyful people coming out. By the way, you know, when you go in this world this week, find, you'll find there's not a lot of joyful people out there. Amen? Amen. There's a lot of angry people. There's a lot of cynical people. There's a lot of people that don't want to talk to you. They'll walk right... You ever, in my neighborhood, I'll walk... I couldn't walk any closer, and they won't even look up. Right, right, right. I have to, I have to, it wouldn't work well if I graduated. Shit. Hey, I'm right here. <laughs> you can say hi. But there's not a lot of joyful people, and these 120, they come uh, out of the upper room, and they're not just speaking one language and everybody hearing it in their language, which is amazing and astonishing, but they're full of joy. They're full of joy exuberance coming from those that had just been filled with the Spirit. But as Peter begins to preach, remember he first started preaching from the book of Joel, explaining what the prophet had prophesied and was being unveiled on this very Pentecost day. And as Peter transitions his message from the prophecy that's being fulfilled, in other words, the Spirit falling on the young men and the young women and people of all ages, he transitions to the promised Messiah himself, Jesus of Nazareth, he starts, whom the chief priests and the leaders had crucified, but in his infinite power, he had risen from the grave three days later, shattering the power of death. The crowd, when Peter begins to speak about Jesus, they suspend their questions. They suspend even their mocking. There was some mocking. Most of it was amazement and astonishment, but there was also some mocking. Hey, these guys are drunk. And they set aside for a moment their astonishment and their amazement, and by the work of the Spirit, they become attentive, what every school teacher hopes her students will be, right? Attentive. They become silent, and they focus in on the words that Peter was preaching. And by the way, I'm fully aware that any time I stand to preach and teach the Word of God, or anyone stands to preach and teach the Word of God, I can't make people be attentive. I trust that the Holy Spirit will help them be attentive. Amen? Amen. I pray that's the case. But only the Holy Spirit can quiet minds and quiet hearts and quiet people's distractions. We all have a lot of distractions. More in 2023 than I think they had 2,000 years ago. One of them sitting in your back pocket or in your purse right now, probably buzzing right now. <laughs> begging you to look and see what's going on out there. People, by the way, can be totally quiet and also totally resistant, can't they? And people can be quiet and not saying anything, but not believe in a word you're saying. I've had that many times. Some of y'all used to be that, and I've seen you get saved. Amen. 
I used to see you like this, not, not the slightest bit interested in what I was saying. It's not me saying it, it's, if it's from the Lord. And people can be distracted. They can be dog-tired. And maybe you're here this morning, you're about to fall asleep because you have an exhausted week. Maybe you're daydreaming. Maybe you're in here planning your next week. Stop. And listen, <laughs> listen to Acts chapter 2. Maybe you're planning your week. Maybe you're figuring out lunch plans. Don't worry, the place will be there. Maybe you're going over your calendar. Now, we all have random thoughts, and we all have random things that pop into our head. It's part of being human. But you say, Lord, recenter me. And God can, you ever witness to somebody and they're going off on all these tangents and finally the spirit, it just clicks and they stop doing it? That's the power of the Holy Spirit. Before they're zigzagging all over the place. Now, as Peter continues to preach to those that are gathered there in Jerusalem, uh, he's just indicated that those uh, that killed Jesus, you know, they're guilty of killing the Son of God. But he immediately assures them, even though they've killed God's Son, he assures them, good news, Jesus is very much alive. You, you didn't pull it off. I mean, you did, but you didn't. That the plan to eliminate, eliminate Jesus did not work. But the plan of God had been fulfilled. I mean, it was in God's plan before the foundation of the earth that he would bring the Lamb slain before the foundations of the earth. It was precisely as the Lord intended. The cross, the Romans, Pilate, Herod, Caiaphas, everything lined up exactly that it had to be Passover week and Jesus would rise on the feast of first fruits and he would then send the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Everything was exactly how God planned. Now all that said, they're still guilty of murder. Amen? They're still guilty of murdering God's Son and at this point, they're still dead in their sins. And by the way, anyone here that's still lost is still guilty of your sins. I'm not going to be guilty of my sins. I got to throw them all on Jesus. How about you? But if you're still unsaved, you're guilty and still in your sins. Now, as Peter quoted from the prophet Joel, here he quotes from the Psalms and King David, who, like Moses and Abraham... All of Israel reveres Abraham, Moses, David. They're, they're, like the, they're like the Mount Rushmore, right? They're like the Mount Rushmore of the Jewish patriarchs, you know, all the, and, the, and you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all of them too, as well. But David was up there. He was very, very much revered. Even Jerusalem, even to this day, is still called the city of David. But Jesus, David was a king. And he was the second king after Saul and, and, and arguably the greatest king in all of Israel's history. Solomon might have had a greater kingdom, but David was the greater king. And so David was a king, but Jesus is the king of kings. And David looks up to Jesus and looks to Jesus. And only Jesus, who is alone the savior of the world, uh, David needed Jesus as well. And his sacrifice and his resurrection is the centerpiece of all eternity and the centerpiece of Israel's history as well. They just don't know that yet until they've come to the Lord. Now, what Peter is presenting to the Jews, and most of them that were gathered there, if not all of them, are very devout. Remember, he speaks about that uh, as well. It, Luke does anyway. Luke mentions that the devout men were there. And most of the Jews, if not all of them, uh, they need to know that Jesus is their Messiah. They don't think that Jesus is the Messiah. They're still looking for the Messiah, even as Peter stands up to preach, that he's letting them know, no, 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 Jesus is the Messiah. It's not going to be David. It's not going to be Elijah. It's not going to be Moses. It wasn't any of those former great men, holy men that God used. And it's not going to be some other king to come from you. The Messiah has already come. And not only had they missed the Messiah, they had murdered the Messiah. They didn't just miss him. It would be one thing if you missed something, but to eliminate it on purpose. Jesus, or Peter's saying, look, you missed your Messiah, but you also are guilty of murdering him. But inciting the very words of David, who they greatly revered, 
who was the great king of Israel, he's going to present from David. He's going to quote from David who they revere, who they have great uh, respect for, the scriptural case. And by the way, if you're going to try and convince anybody in this world of anything, do it from the scriptures, amen? The scriptural case case. You're not going to win them over with, well, I read on this uh, so-and-so blog. That's not going to probably get it done. The scriptures have power. But he's going to present the scriptural case that the resurrection of the Messiah was prophesied by David himself, and David himself was looking to Jesus in advance. Mm -hmm. And by the way, Jesus may have taught the disciples, what Peter stands up to preach here. If you have your Bibles, turn real quick to Luke chapter 24. Um, if you can take a quick turn there, and I won't make you, if you're slow at it, I'm going to read this anyway. But Luke chapter 24, it's a left-hand turn. You're in Acts, you got John, then you got Luke. Uh, but it's a left-hand turn. Luke chapter 24, and verses 44 and 45 it's your only homework of the entire morning that I'm aware of, and that's it right there. Then he said to them, here's the verse, two verses. Then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets, and here it is, and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. This is after he'd raised from the dead. This was the night, uh, the night that he had walked on, with the two men on the road to Emmaus. And when that evening concluded, he sat down, and this is what he said right here. He basically taught them an Old Testament survey class in a matter of a short amount of time and showed them, including in the Psalms, and notice that Peter stands up and now preaches from the Psalms. So we don't know for sure. But the Holy Spirit could have given Peter this insight instantaneously because Jesus also said in the upper room, on that day you won't know what to say, but the Spirit will give you the words and give you exactly what you're supposed to say. So it's probably a combination of both, what Jesus had taught that night as well as what the Holy Spirit gave him in the moment. Pick it up with me back in verses 24, uh, 25 through 28. For David says concerning him, now he's quoted from the Psalms here, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, he is at my right hand that I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Verse 26. Moreover my flesh also rest in hope. 27. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to seek corruption. Verse 28. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. The Jews at that time, so you look at that passage, that's directly from Psalm chapter 16. So it some of your Bibles, it probably has it in italics, and you can see a little footnote. It should say Psalm 16. Now, the Jews at that time, and the scribes, and the Pharisees, and the leaders, they had always considered this passage, because they studied all the Old Testament, they had considered this passage to be David talking about David, that David was talking about himself, that David was just speaking of himself. And it's interesting that the passage, if you read the passage, you can read it equally as David speaking of David, or you can read it as the Messiah speaking of the Messiah. And it works perfectly. You can read it either way. David, except for one little portion, we'll look at that. There's only one little portion that has to be the Messiah. The rest of it can all be read David talking about David, or Jesus, or the Messiah, because they didn't know who's, who, who the Messiah would be, just that a Messiah was coming, the Messiah of himself. Now, David wrote this portion as a prophet of God. David started out his life as a shepherd boy. Then God calls him to be the king of Israel. And not only does he become king, he never becomes a priest because he wasn't a Levite, but he's from the tribe of Judah. But he does become a king, but he also becomes a prophet. God makes him a prophet. Just like Samuel, who anointed him as a prophet, David also becomes a prophet of God. We don't know if you think of him that way, but... Uh, he wrote this portion as a prophet. And while speaking, and by the way, uh, we know that David was a prophet because Peter preaches it. Look at verse 30, therefore being a prophet. <laughs> so they say, well, did you just make that? No, Peter preached it that day that David was a prophet. Verse 30, but it, that's getting ahead for just a second. So he writes this portion as a prophet, and while David 
is speaking of himself. I have no doubt that as David's writing this or getting it from the Holy Spirit, he is speaking of himself. Look at the, look at the text. I foresaw the Lord. David always was looking to the Lord, always before my face. Uh, he's at my right hand. Jesus was at David's right hand. Uh, that I should not be shaken. David would not be shaken in front of a lion or a bear or Goliath. All these things perfectly line up with David. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. David would sing songs of joy and his heart was glad. Uh, moreover, his flesh will rest in hope. He's resting in the hope that God will raise him from the dead. You'll not leave my soul in Hades. Here the word Hades means grave. It can mean hell, but it doesn't mean hell here. It means grave. So yeah, not leave my soul in the grave. You may. Uh, then we'll stop right there for just a second because we'll get to the portion that doesn't really apply to him. But he's speaking as a prophet. And again, simultaneously, these passages can apply to David or they can apply to the Messiah. How can they simultaneously apply to David and the Messiah? Well, because all Scripture is God-breathed. And the way that God lined it up is, David, this passage will, will kind of speak 100% to you, and yet it will forward 100% to the Messiah well, maybe 97%, because there's one part that can't apply to David. We'll just see in a second. But David is speaking this, and the Holy Spirit is saying, it's going to be about your life for now, but about his life to come. So it's not either or, it's both and. You see the two passages on the, uh, on the, pit, on the uh, screen there. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and we know that the Holy Spirit spoke, and men of God then wrote or were moved by the Spirit. If we read these four verses, and again, Hades means grave, as if David's speaking them, or David's speaking exclusively of himself, it all fits until the second half, where I stop there, the second half of verse 27, all fits until you get to the second half, where he says in verse 27, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. There it does, that's the, that's the only part that doesn't really fit David. And so this part, David was... 100% prophesying to the Messiah. All the other part was about him and the Messiah. But this part, this second half of the verse, can only apply to the Messiah himself. The word corruption, when you see that word, it literally means destruction. But more importantly, it means the decay of a body after death. The decay of a body after death. That's an ugly thing. Nobody wants to see it. That's why you put it under the ground so no one has to see it, smell it, anything else, right? The decay of a body is that corruption. Every single body that has ever died in the history of the world, from Adam and Eve all the way till now, every single body that has ever died before David, including David, after David, except one body has decayed. There's only one body, and that's Jesus' body, right? Every other body has been four plus days in the grave, which starts to decay, it starts to break down, it eventually turns to dust, and you get skeletons and bones, right? right. Jesus is the only body that never corrupted or decayed. Even the other people he raised from the dead eventually died, right? Lazarus, well, Lazarus, he was decaying. He was starting to stink on the fourth day. Jesus raised him dead. Well, Lazarus doesn't get, no, because Lazarus, 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 then goes on to still die, right? Right, right? Now, there's two exceptions in the Old Testament, but they didn't die. Enoch, it looks like, walked right up into heaven, and Elijah went up in a fiery chariot, so they couldn't decay. And if the rapture happens while I'm preaching this, I'm not going to decay, and neither will you if you're saved, right? So those are the, the only out clauses are a rapture. There's two personal raptures in the Old Testament, Enoch and Elijah, and we're waiting for the rapture of the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, and then there'd be no decay of the body. But on any other person, everybody that dies, no matter how good you are, no matter how great you live for Christ, your body will decay, but it won't be left there. That's the difference. David could say, well, my body won't be left in the grave. That would be true. But the corruption part would not be for him. That would only be for the Messiah because he's not going to leave my body. And we're all going to get our body. He's gonna, even people that die in the Titanic that were saved and their body has been disintegrated by the salt of the sea will be refused back together. But that will be a new body. Since then, those bodies have all decayed. Verses 29. Uh, as, so... 
Uh, Peter continues on with uh, the, this truth in his preaching in verse 29. He says, so drop down to verse 29. Now he speaks directly back to the audience. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David. Now they would have known. Now first of all, he started in verse 25. He says, for David says of himself. Now we know that David was speaking of himself because of verse 25. David says concerning himself. Uh, or, sorry, David says concerning him. We know that David was writing it, but he always was looking to the Messiah but here he says in verse 29, men and brethren, let me freely speak to you of the patriarch David. So he's appealing to them again. You guys know David. You guys all revere him. He is a patriarch. We all look up to how God used him in this world. Brethren, you know, though, he goes on to say, you know that his tomb, he is both dead and buried. His tomb is with us. So he says, look, we're in Jerusalem. We're in the city of David. He was buried in this very city. He's like, he's buried here. You guys know if we opened up the tomb, we'd find bones and ashes, dust, dirt. And he goes on to say, verse, therefore, being a prophet, David being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn an oath to him that from the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. So he's saying, because David was a prophet, now you know he died, you know his body corrupted, but God gave him this prophecy speaking of the Messiah to come, that David knew when he was alive that God had given him a promise that someone from his loins, someone from his lineage, lineage would end up being the king who would sit on an eternal throne and David's throne would be occupied by someone that came from him, from the line of David, from the tribe of Judah. And that one would be the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. And Israel was looking for, remember, they were looking for the Messiah, they just didn't believe Jesus was him. That's why they killed him. They were looking for, and they're still, if you meet devout Jewish people today, and there's people that are Jewish that are atheist, and Sam uh, has ministered all over the world to Jewish people of all different backgrounds, but you've got the Orthodox Jews, you know, the black hats and the, the ringlets and all that stuff. They, there's some that are still very devout and looking for the Messiah, but the Messiah has already come. And he's saying, look, David was looking to the Messiah that would actually defeat death and that one would take uh, the throne and he would be raised up from David according to the flesh. And of course, that would be the line of Mary's side. And he goes on in verse 31, the, uh, the, he foreseeing this spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ that he, his soul was not left in Haiti, or the grave, nor did his flesh see corruption or decay. And so David, by the Spirit of God, foresaw that the Messiah would be raised from the dead. David understood that the Messiah would die, but would rise before he could be corrupted. And that can only happen in the three-day window. So David was given this understanding by God, he understood that the Messiah was going to die, that he was going to uh, give up his life, but that he would not see corruption. Now, he says here, um, he goes on, he says that his soul would not be left in Hades. So he's referring directly, Peter's referring directly to what was written in Psalm 16. He's now commenting on what he just read. He's doing a commentary on what he read from Psalm 16 in his message. It only applies to Jesus, um, but David, and we know that David uh, himself, uh, we knew when he died, he was not going to be resurrected three days later. He was looking for his hope, he was looking for his Messiah, but he was foreseeing that the Messiah would be resurrected from the dead. He goes on in verse 32 here. Uh, this Jesus, ha uh, this Jesus, God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. So Peter's saying now, everything that David was looking towards, me and the other eleven and the hundred and twenty, we have seen with our own eyes that Jesus is the one David was prophesying about. Jesus is the one who defeated the grave. Jesus is the one that did not see corruption. We are witnesses that this is the Messiah 
that in fact David was looking towards. And he says uh, he's being inclusive of all the other, this is uh, of which we are all witnesses, being himself and the other disciples. And remember when they come out of the upper room, they're all glorifying God. They're all speaking. They're all testifying. They're all praising that God has raised his son. You can imagine the things that they were saying. So he's saying, we are all collectives. Peter is the spokesperson, but you kind of see the other 11 standing behind him, now including Matthias, as well as the 120. So he's saying, this is what God has done, and we have uh, witnessed it with our own eyes. Verse 33, uh, he goes on, therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. So he's speaking specifically of everything that took place that morning, everything you've seen, everything you have heard. So he's referring back to the fact that he says that, uh, the, therefore having exalted the right hand of God and received from the promise of the Father the Holy Spirit. So Exalted to the right hand of God is the ascension of Jesus. On the Mount of Olives, they saw Jesus literally go up into heaven. Anyone that saw David die, no one sat there and all watched David glide up into heaven. David died as an old man. They buried him in his own tomb, and that was that. I mean, his soul went to heaven, but his body stayed there and was still there even while Peter's preaching in the city of David. But they were on the Mount of Olives, and they saw Jesus ascend up. And back into heaven, then remember the angels, two, two angels appear and say, why are you guys looking up into heaven? Yeah. You know, you've got business to do, and you go on and get, get on with what Jesus has told you to do. They had witnessed the ascension, but Jesus didn't just ascend back into heaven. He sat down at the right hand of the Father. And Peter's saying, and from his throne in heaven, he poured out the Holy Spirit. Now, we've always think, I've usually until I've dug into it myself. I usually have always thought of Pentecost from the perspective of everyone there in Jerusalem, but heaven has its own perspective too, doesn't it? Yeah. The top-down view of God and Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father pouring out the Holy Spirit, that's a vantage point that we won't understand until we get there, but we get a little bit of a glimpse of it because Jesus, he says, poured out the Holy Spirit from his throne in heaven. The manifestation of manifestation of the Spirit. In other words, the Father, just like the Father is going to tell the Son when it's time to go get the bride, at some level we don't understand, he's like, Pentecost is the day I'm sending the Holy Spirit. And that's the day it happened. And Jesus and the Father are in one there in unity when the Spirit is poured out. And he says, everything you've seen and heard, and of course they heard the wind, the crowd heard the wind coming. They heard Peter speaking in one language, but being heard in 30, 40, 50 languages or more there in Jerusalem. So these are things that they saw, these are things that they heard, which he says, you've seen the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and all that was promised by Jesus. Verse 34 and 35, for David did not ascend to the heavens. Now, Peter's expressly making the point that David didn't have an ascension. Only Jesus had an ascension. Only Jesus had a uh, grave destroying resurrection. Only Jesus had an ascension. For day, you know, only Jesus came down and had a virgin birth. There's many things that apply only to Jesus. Remember, David was also born in Bethlehem. Jesus is born in Bethlehem. They have a lot of parallels, but, but David falls well short. He has a lot of foreshadows, if you will, but he's not the Messiah. He says of himself, now, he's, now he goes back to a, David again and goes back to the Psalms, but a different part of the Psalms. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. He comes back to David again, another monumental difference between David and Jesus. Uh, and we understand that David doesn't have an ascension. Jesus does. He goes back into heaven. David foresaw this, and um, this is recorded in Psalm 110, you can look it up and, or if you're taking notes, Psalm 110. So he goes from Psalm 16 to Psalm 110 here, speaking, still using David to make the case that Jesus is the Messiah that they not only missed, but they murdered. Verse 36, therefore, let all the house of Israel know, assuredly, that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified. This is a way to get run out of town right here. Whom you crucified. 
Remember, the high priest is in this group. Peter was petrified of these guys the night of the, of the crucifixion or the night of the trial. Peter was so petrified, he denied Jesus three times, said he even cursed everything he could do to convince them that he didn't know Jesus. And now he's standing up saying, you murderers did it. But he's going to extend the grace and mercy of the gospel. And God just obviously puts a hedge of protection around that day that he can say all of these things and there's not going to be a hand laid on him uh, later in his life, he's going to die a martyr's death, but not on this day. Uh, God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Isn't that good to know that there's times where God will give you, it's like, you're going to be able to say all this and don't sweat it. Amen. Now, he wants you to say that even at the end, like Peter will have to say that at the end of his life. But here, he stands up and he says this, and he makes it clear. He comes back to the crowd in Jerusalem, and he lays the evidence out. He lays the glory and the victory of what God has done through Jesus out. And once again, he lays the stinging indictment that they placed Jesus on the cross, that they're still guilty of murdering the Messiah. Even though the Messiah conquered death and he's alive and he's in heaven, they're still guilty. And not just the people that had the authority to do it, like the Sanhedrin, like Caiaphas the priest. Everyone that was yelling, give us Barabbas, is guilty. Everyone that was shouting, crucify him, is guilty. And all those people still live in Jerusalem. And some of them that were, there at Pente uh, that were there for Passover have come back because it was one of the three feasts that the, the men had to come, and, uh, come to Jerusalem for. So they know that they're guilty of saying these things, crucify him. Verse 37, now when they heard this, this indictment, not only this indictment, but the case made from the Psalm 16 and from Psalm 110, and Peter preaching this with the power and authority, Authority of the Holy Spirit, an untrained fisherman, by the way, giving a thesis on the Old Testament and David himself and the Psalms. They're like, did this guy go to university somewhere in the last few weeks that we don't know about? How does he know these things? And he makes some pretty good points because, you know, David didn't really ascend up into heaven. Not, not that anyone could see visibly. Verse 37, they were, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And Peter and the rest of the apostles said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Amen. They spoke back to the apostles, what should we do? Uh, when we present the gospel, Amen. which includes, when you're telling someone the gospel, includes that they need a Savior, Amen. and that Jesus is that Savior, and they need shed they need his shed blood, and they need his resurrection, and it's the only way to salvation. There's not many roads that lead to heaven. There's one. There's not many doors. There's one. There's not many paths. There's one. And then the reality that every single soul that's ever born is born guilty and is in their sins, not just this crowd then, every crowd ever since, every person ever since. But we hope this is the response. What should we do? Because sometimes you get a response like, I don't believe that. Right. I don't believe the Bible. I don't believe it's written by a bunch of men. It's got all these translations. It's written by all kinds of people. You know how many mistakes are in it? Like, Show me one. <laughs> and they usually can't. Amen. Well, I just heard it from a professor at college. That's it. They said that it, that it was flawed. There was all this other stuff. And I'm like, uh, I'm here to tell you my own life is a living witness of what God can do. And you guys have your own testimony. Amen. But they say, what should we do? We hope this is the response. It, it, they were cut to the heart, it says. They were cut to the heart, verse 37. And they say, what should we do? The miracle of the languages. Peter speaking one language, everybody hearing him in 30, 40, 50 languages. That's amazing. But that produced a lot of astonishment, but also produced a little bit of mocking. Hey, they're drunk, which makes no sense at all. I talked about that two weeks ago. You've never seen a drunk person learn new languages, ever. <laughs> Never. They get really bad at the English language or whatever language they speak. It goes downhill fast. They slur and, and words come together. I do that when I'm speaking too fast, but that's a different story. But the gospel and the word of God produces conviction. Amen. Conviction. By the way, I don't pray that when I preach that there's any amazement, but I do pray that there's acknowledgement, that people acknowledge where they're really at that they acknowledge who God really is. They acknowledge what they really need. That people would see their condition, that they would see 
their need. Verse 38 and 39, as we come to a close here, uh, then Peter said to them, because they asked, what should we do? He said, all right, I'm going to tell you. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Peter tells them what they need to do. They say, what should we do? He, he says, you've got to repent. What John the forerunner had preached, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. What Jesus pre preached, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent means to change your mind. We have a lot of people in America that need a mind change, don't they? They think this is right and they couldn't be more wrong. They need a mind change. But it's not just to change your mind. It also means, in parallel, to abhor your sin. And you can't automatically abhor your sin. God has to give you and a abhorrence for your sin. That's where the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden you start to see your sin as sinful. You know people that have really hurt people all their life and don't care at all? When they fall under conviction, they want to go back and make things right, right? Zacchaeus had stolen from all kinds of people. All of a sudden he didn't think that was no big deal. To abhor your sins mean, wow, Lord, I can't even make... Do you know some things we can't even make right in this lifetime? Yeah. All you can do is lay it all at the feet of Jesus. You can't even make it right if you wanted to. Amen. But it means to change your mind. It means to abhor your sin. Uh, Charles Spurgeon said, the old-fashioned grace of repentance is not to be dispensed with. There must be sorrow for sin. There must be a broken and a contrite heart. This God will not despise, but a conversion which does not produce this result, God will not accept as genuine. Because many are going to say someday, Lord, Lord, and Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. You never, you never really changed your mind. You never really abhorred your sin. And you never really allowed the conviction that I gave you to throw yourself. Remember Jesus said, whoever lands on this rock will be broken, but whoever the rock lands on will be ground into powder. Yeah. And that, that really resonated with me. I'm like, when I got saved, even though I'd said sinner's prayers before that never worked, when I fell on the rock, I got broken. Amen. And all of a sudden, I cared about sins that I couldn't even fix, but I left. Then you could give them to Jesus. You didn't have to fix them. Amen. You just left them all with him. But you didn't go back and do them either. Right. Or you didn't want to go back and do them. Every, time then, every now and then, you have a, a, a slip up. We're like, how did I think that again? Right? right, 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 right. But that's, that's the old man that still lives within you, that's being di is dying to the work of the Spirit. If the mind admits that we're sinners and the mind admits that Jesus alone is salvation, then to turn to him and to believe, which is faith, and to turn from our sins is then the repentance of obedience. To Lord, I don't, I'm just not, Lord, I'm, I don't know how I'm going to stop doing this, but by your grace, I'm done with that. And you don't have to say, how am I going to pull that off? That's where Jesus comes in. That's where the Holy Spirit comes in. And then he says, uh, then be baptized. Well, baptism is that first step of obedience. You don't have to have someone to twist your arm into it. You want, you're ready. Say, I want to be baptized because it's what Jesus commands. That baptism signifies we're dying to our old selves and being made alive to walk in Christ and with Christ and, by, uh, and only by the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because without the Holy Spirit... I would have given up years ago. How about you? Yeah. If I did not have the Holy Spirit, I promise you, I'm not, this is not hyperbole. If I did not have the Holy Spirit, there's no way I would have made it a month unless I was some false prophet prosperity pastor. I wouldn't have made it a month. Mm -hmm. But if you're really going to live the Christian life, like really take up your cross and follow him, you can't do it without the Holy Spirit. You, it's too hard. You would give up. It signifies dying to ourself, and we have to have the Holy Spirit, but uh, even when you turn from your sin, even when you hate your sin, only the Holy Spirit can help you break the chains of sin. Amen? I mean, you can hate it and abhor it. You can abhor your sin, and you still can't fix that problem. You need the Holy Spirit's power to overcome even what you abhor. This is how strong the flesh is. 
And this promise of salvation, he says, this promise is to you and your children, to all who are far off and as many as the Lord will call. This promise of salvation uh, for those that turn to Christ is this promise of repentance is for all people, all ethnicities, all tribes, all skin tones. A far off means far off lands and far off a time. We constitute both. We are halfway around the world from Israel and we're 2,000 years away from Pentecost and we are the afar off, amen? amen. We're, we're the descendants of those that got saved that day, spiritually speaking. Verse 40, and with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. This reminds me of people, Peter continues to exhort, and with many words, this reminds me of people who don't respond to the first invitation. Uh -huh. Peter's like, I know there's more of you that need to be saved. Uh -huh. Maybe it was... 1,000 at first, then it was 2,000, then it got to 3,000 or whatever. Um, I did not respond on the first invitation at Calvary Fort Lauderdale. There was like 10 other people up there before me, but the Spirit was moving heavily upon me to say, this is your day. <laughs> Don't even think about another day. This is your day to be saved. My wife and I both got saved on the same day. Uh, but a lot of people have been saved on the third altar call if you will. I'm not saying that you can only be saved altar calls. I'm just giving the point that Peter here is giving what amounts to an altar call. He's given a, a time of decision. They're convinced, uh, but sometimes not immediately, uh, even with their conviction. The rich young ruler, he was convinced Jesus was the one, but he still wouldn't give in. But you can, so in other words, you can be convinced that you need Jesus and still not surrender to him. But conviction is always the first thing. A person has to know they're guilty to want to receive the forgiveness of their guilt. If, if they don't think they're guilty, they don't think that's why you meet a lot of people that don't think they need Jesus. They don't think they're guilty. They think they're better than 90% of the other people. So they don't think they need God. But conviction is so important. You have to be convinced that you need Jesus. I'll actually put this little list up here. The work of God is salvation. The Holy Spirit has to bring the conviction. The mind has to be convinced. The heart has to become contrite. In other words, Lord, I'm sorry. The mouth has to confess. Paul talked about this. Uh, if we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouth, he's risen from the dead, you'll be saved. And finally, the soul is converted. Remember that the first part and the last part, God's the bookend of this whole thing. He starts the conviction and he finishes the conversion. In between, we have to choose him back. Amen? Amen. He's saying, I'm, I'm offering it to you, but you have to respond. Because they said, what should we do? He didn't say, go baptize the Jordan a bunch of times, like back in the Old Testament with Naaman. He says, you're going to have to repent. You're going to have to turn. All of these finish in verse uh, 41. Then those who gladly received his word, last verse this morning, received his word, were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Praise the Lord for that. About 3,000 souls. These are those that chose Jesus when they were convicted. They became convinced they needed him at that moment. They became contrite. And if, if they were yelling, give us Barabbas, they were sorry for that. They confessed their sins, and they were converted. They had chosen Jesus. He had chosen them first, but they chose back his salvation. They chose his eternity in heaven over the passing pleasures of this world. Uh, I got to admit, the world, I'm not attracted to the same things I was before salvation, thankfully. Like, like some of those things, just you cannot, like certain things you could put like uh, stacks of liquor in front of me, and it does not, it, I'm not the slightest, I used to bartend in college, that, that stuff just does not appeal to me anymore. I don't really care, I, I don't care if you're enjoying it, I don't want it, but the world itself still is attractive in its kind of like carefree, do whatever you want kind of lifestyle, amen? But it's all passing pleasures, isn't it? Yes. It's just a vapor, and everyone there realized that eternity is way too long, and our souls are way too important, and they gave their lives to Christ. That 3,000 added to the family of God, that was the greatest work of the Spirit on Pentecost. Greater than the rushing wind, greater than the fire over their head, greater than all. This was the great work. And amazingly, Peter, who had failed miserably, filled with the Spirit, stands, and Peter would be the first to tell you, he could not produce a harvest, only the Holy Spirit could. Amen? Amen. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you again.
that your spirit does the work of convicting, that your word is powerful. And even what you wrote hundreds of years before, you had intended that one of your apostles would stand and expound on what David had written, that David's foresight would become the text of Peter's preaching, and the text would be empowered by the Holy Spirit, and Lord, it would prick the hearts of over 3,000 souls. And Lord, if there is even one soul here this morning that has been pricked by the conviction of the Spirit that they need to come to the Savior even this morning, I pray, Lord, that they would not hesitate, but that they would call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. And before we take these elements to close this morning, if there's even one person here that the Lord is speaking to you and saying, it's your day to put your name or to put your faith in Jesus and call upon his name, that he would write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. There's even one here that says, I, I want to give my life to Christ this morning. I don't want to put it off any longer. Raise your hand. I want to pray with you. If there's even one that's ready to give their heart and life to Christ, say, I want to, I want to give my life to Jesus today. I don't want to put it off. I know I'm guilty of my sins. I know that I have sins I could never fix if I wanted to, but I know that he can cleanse and forgive and he will. And he, even one. I don't want to belabor it, but I also want to give that opportunity. For the rest of us, if, if we all know the Lord, if we all know the Lord as our Lord and Savior, um, we have the same opportunity as Peter. We've all failed a lot. We've all fallen. But we can be used in ways that are beyond our comprehension. Peter would have never seen this as possible Remember when Jesus kind of lifted him back up there at the shores and said, feed my sheep, tend my... He did not see this day coming. But the Holy Spirit uses flawed vessels like us. And one of the reasons why we take the Lord's Supper is to be reminded that we are very weak and that Jesus' blood not only saved us, but it empowers... His life empowers us to live the Christian life, which is a really hard life to live. It's impossible to live without His help. And so we look back to his salvation with gratitude, but we also look to him for his help and strength. If you do not have the elements, raise your hand, and, and these guys will make sure. I think most of you have them, but a few do not. Tuan's just going to play quietly. Just take a moment to pray and, and just thank Jesus for coming and living and preaching and dying for your sins and my sins, and then conquering death, and we'll take these elements in a celebratory manner at the end here in just a moment. We are so thankful. We're humbled. Lord, we know that uh, even long after we've been saved, some of us have been saved for many years, some of us just a few years, maybe some here less than a year. Uh, Lord, even after we've been saved, we still don't comprehend the depth of what you've done for us. Uh, we just, we don't even see our own wretchedness. 
We understand, though, a little bit of how Paul could say that he was the chief of sinners because every time he looked at himself, Lord, in the face of your perfection, it it just shows us how flawed and how, Lord, wretched we are. But we thank you, Jesus, that you looked past our sins and you died even while we were at sinners, you died for us. And we just want to say thank you for washing us and cleansing us. Thank you for giving your body, your blood. Thank you for conquering death. Thank you that you are seated at the right hand of the Father. Thank you that you poured out your spirit, that you breathed upon us your spirit. You've given us the seal of the spirit, but Lord, you also promised if we desire it, the baptism of the spirit. Thank you for baptizing the whole body of Christ into your spirit. And thank you, Lord, that you give us your spirit to live in a world that still despises you. And Lord, we pray that uh, as we grow in your grace, that you give us a voice that is empowered by your spirit, for people will not listen to us, but they are convicted by your word. And so, Jesus, we just thank you for all that you established there in the upper room uh, when you broke the bread and distributed uh, these elements. But Lord, we thank you for what you continue to do in our lives through the work of salvation, your spirit. And uh, Lord, we just ask your washing, your cleansing, and your filling of us this morning, for we need your help to go through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and through the coming week to be lights and witnesses for you. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. In Luke's gospel, and he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take of the bread. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Let's take of the cup. Why don't you stand? I'm just going to close in prayer. We won't have a closing worship song for a couple of reasons. Once, you go get your children. (laughs) Two, so you would support the bake sale. Say, well, I've had too much sugar already. Give it to some, tempt somebody else with it. Yeah, I'm kidding. Uh, uh, Give give those cookies to a neighbor or something. Give them to somebody, bless somebody else with them, or even if you're not going to eat them yourself, uh, it's for the work of this Vacation Bible School, so we appreciate uh, your help. And so all that is outside under the tents. Uh, Even if you don't buy anything, they'll be glad to uh, help you support it. So thank you very much. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for this time in your word. And Lord, we pray that uh, we'd walk this week in your spirit, uh, just as you used Peter and the other disciples. You would use us uh, in our city today as you used them in Jerusalem and fill us afresh and anew, we pray. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great rest of the day.